Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be here again with you all. It's been about a year now, and I don't know how long we've been coming here, but it's been a long time. I'm glad to do so. I can remember we celebrated my 40th here um, many years ago, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am now, but much more than 40. I'm so glad to see you all. So glad to grow old with you all, and it will be greater to be in eternity with you all as well. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And we're going to consider verse 7 through chapter 8 and verse 11 this morning. 2017, a bicyclist up in Colorado decided to leave his house for about three weeks and to go cycle throughout Colorado and the surrounding states. He came home three weeks later to find a group of squatters living in his house. They had moved on in. They even brought a crib in for one of their babies. They were running up his utilities. They were eating his food, and he asked them to leave, and they refused to leave. So he went to the cops. And the cops said, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about this. They say there is a loophole in Denver law that if you leave your house, then someone can move in and to claim it as theirs. And the only way to get rid of it, or them, was to then go through the court system and to evict them as if you would evict someone who wasn't paying your lease or their rent. Well, unfortunately, that happened. And I know none of us in this room would like to leave home for a couple, three days, come back and find someone in our house just living there, right? But in a spiritual sense, that's kind of what happens. You see, there was a time many years ago with most of us in this room that we reached the age of accountability. And when we reached that age of accountability, someone did knock, but he was a liar from the beginning, John chapter 8 and in verse 44. And that knocker was claiming that he was going to give us a better way. And maybe your better way at that time was to cuss or to lie to get out of a situation or to steal something that you wanted from the local general store or Walmart or whatever it was. But the reality is Satan knocked on each and every one of us over the age of accountability and we let him in. And when we let him in, we thought things would be better. But it was at, a, at that moment in time that perhaps we realized, no, things are not better, but now things are worse. And the problem now is, how do we get rid of him? How do we get rid of the uninvited guests? Well, we don't have a court system that we can go through and file some paperwork and get him out within 30 days or so. How do we overcome? How do we solve the problems that he has brought upon us? Because the reality is, when he entered into us, well, the soul that sins, it shall die. Ezekiel chapter 18 and in verse 4. Paul talks about this in Romans 7 and in verse 11. And he says, for sin, taking opportunity through the commandment. Notice what it does. It deceives me and killed me through it. So I stand before you this morning because, unfortunately, and I hate it, I hate to be deceived. I have been deceived. And you as well have been deceived also. And this deceiver has brought forth sin and death into the lives of all of us who are above the age of accountability. And the reality is, I don't like deception, and I know you don't either. If you go buy an automobile today, at the, and you decide to buy it alone or whatever the case. And they promise you, yeah, we don't have any extra fees at this car lot. You know how they do, right? And you believe them and you don't check it. And you get home and you check the bill of sale. And it's like, bam, they tacked on this. They tacked on that. They tacked on this. And that, that upsets you, doesn't it? It upsets us that we have people in our society today who call the elderly constantly on their telephones trying to deceive them and get their identity and to steal their identity from them or to empty their bank accounts. The reality is this type of deception, it, it upsets us, especially those of us who consider ourselves to be righteous. We hate deception, and we especially hate it when someone gets hurt, or even worse, someone is killed. 
because of it. Well, upon the time that the uninvited guest deceived us and entered into our flesh, bringing sin and death, he brought two types of death. He brought physical death, and he brought spiritual death, or spiritual, which means we're dead to God. The physical death means we inherit a body upon birth that is eventually going to die. It's doomed to die. And spiritual death means now we are separated between us and God because we have sin. And we know that separation is permanent until we turn to him. But the reality is God has paved the way, and we know it, so that we can be reunited with him in glory. And that is our desire, is to be reunited with him not only on this earth, but in eternal glory. Matter of fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and in verse 11, the wise man wrote that God has set eternity in our hearts. And what he means by that is God has set in us as something that's instinctual, that causes us to long for something more than is found here on planet earth. That's why the Indians had their happy hunting ground, right? That's why the pharaohs built their big old pyramids and buried themselves and their, and their spouses who were alive and all of their servants with silver and gold all at the same time because everyone has some sort of understanding. We have this sort of understanding to motivate us today. But the reality is, no matter how motivated we are to live for Christ, Satan has sunk his claws into our flesh and to our mind. And he's something that we have to deal with. But yet we can't overcome. And it's not through anything that we have done on our own, but we can overcome through God and the gifts that he's given us. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, Paul talks about this. And he says that God, notice he sent the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Why? So that we, so that he can set men free from the law of sin and death. So therefore he sent a law of the spirit of life so that we can be set free from this bondage that Satan has put each and every one of us in. Meaning, in Romans chapter 5 and in verse 12, while we were yet sinners, come on, you know it, Christ died for us. He came to pave a way by his blood straight to the throne of God. And today, many of us in this room have accepted the beginnings of that way. And if you were like me, this is what happened. We heard the gospel message and we appreciated it. We submitted ourselves and we confessed and we repented. And, and, and because of our faith, we were baptized into Christ. And upon our baptism, our sins were washed away. We received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we came up out of that watery grave and we thought, wow, that's cool, that's awesome. People were singing, people were praying, and people were hugging, everybody was excited, and we may have thought to ourselves, wow, I'm overcome. And I don't know, it might have been 30 minutes later, three hours later, three days later, someone knocked on our brain and said, man, 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 boo, boo, guess who's still here? <laughs> and the reality is, none of us like that. None of us are grateful for that. We thought perhaps by accepting Christ, everything would be taken care of. Well, baptism may change condition with the Father, but it does not change the flesh. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, Paul said it this way, And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Notice this. If Christ is in you, but the body is dead. What does that mean? That means even though we were raised with Christ, we still have <laughs> Satan with us. And now we have Christ with us. And we know Satan doesn't want to share this with Christ. Christ doesn't want to share this with Satan. And we don't want to share this with Satan either. But that is our plight, unfortunately. So then how do we get him out? How do we get rid of him? Well, first and foremost, we need to understand it can only take place if we're in Christ. But secondly, we need to understand this is not a battle that I face alone. It's a battle all of us face. 
All of us continue to deal with Satan and those claws of his as he digs them into us more and more each and every day. And we need to understand we're not the only ones that Satan has attacked. Even the great apostle Paul, Satan attacked. And notice what Paul said about this, about his struggle. He said in chapter 7 and verse 15, For I do not practice what I will to do, but I do the things that I hate. Does that sound like y'all? Yeah. <laughs> what about 7 and 17? It is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. 719, but the evil I do not want is what I do. 7 and 21, I find it in all that I desire to do good, but evil is present with me. Well, friends, this war with the uninvited guests that Paul was dealing with clearly sounds like my war. And I would assume it sounds like your battle as well. But up to this point, we can see that, yes, we may have a battle. We can see, yes, an uninvited guest may have entered himself into us. We can see God has placed eternity in our hearts. But we also can see that God has given us what he needs to so that we can overcome today. But before we look at what we must do in order to overcome, Paul mentioned several things that we can do that will not help us overcome. So five things that will not help us overcome, real fast. Number one, knowledge alone will not help us overcome. Notice chapter 7 and in verse 11. He says, we know the law is spiritual. We can know God's word. We can know how many times the word grace is found in the Bible, how many times the word love is found in the Bible. We can quote entire books of the Bible, perhaps, if you spend the time studying them, right? We can know all the ins and outs, but in the end, knowledge alone means what? There are people all throughout the world today who, who can quote large portions of the Bible, and they've studied the Bible for years, but they cannot understand Acts 2.38 at all. Just because you know something. I know you all like to hear stories about Jason. <laughs> Jason and I like to golf. We really do. And we get together, oftentimes we like to golf, and we both know the drill, right? You got a club, and you got a little white ball, and then there's something way out there, about yay big, you put the white ball in it. We know that. But I tell you, brother, you have never seen anyone shank a golf ball as far as my brother can. <laughs> We've stood on tee boxes before, and his ball ended up five holes on the other side of the golf course from one swing. He can hit it. Yeah. <laughs> Just not straight. <laughs> and friends, he knows. I know. I know that the goal is to get the ball in the hole, but that doesn't make me Tiger Woods. I, I know you take the football and you tuck it underneath your arms, but that doesn't make me Emmett Smith. I know those things. So the reality is, yes, we can know God's word, but that alone doesn't always suffice. Secondly, we can see in chapter 8 and in verse 3, other laws cannot rid you of the uninvited guest. Other laws cannot rid you of the uninvited guest. Notice, he says, for what the law could not do. Now, he's talking about the Old Testament law here, which, of course, the Colossians 2, 14 and following was nailed to the cross. We understand that. But secondarily, he's talking about any law that any human has ever created as well. There is no law that we can create on our own that will help us get rid of this uninvited guest. There's only one, the law of faith, the law of the Spirit that Christ has brought us. And we'll touch more on this in a second. But thirdly, prayer. In Romans <laughs> chapter 8 and in verse 26, we can read about prayer and how the Spirit will intercede for us while we pray. A wonderful passage. It gives us great encouragement to know that the Holy Spirit is groaning on our behalf and interceding for us. But prayer alone, have you ever heard someone before, maybe you're suffering something, and someone's like, I'll just pray about it, as if prayer from time to time is some magic formula all by itself. We know great things can happen through prayer, but if you are a Christian dealing with sin, and all you're going to do is pray, 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 but you never worship, you never fellowship with the saints, you don't do the other things, well, how much is prayer going to help? So prayer alone isn't going to get the job done. And then fourth, and I know this doesn't come from the passage here, 
But some people will say, worship alone. Every time the doors are open, if you just darken the doors and come to worship, you'll be able to overcome Satan. You may not have a prayer life. You may not partake of your daily bread, being the word of God. You may not fellowship with the saints anywhere else. But the reality is there are some that have that mentality. And then, number five, self-help books. You know, there are a lot of people out there today that tend to think that the Bible gives us laws and requirements. But if you want to know the special code and how to get to heaven, you need to buy their self-help book. You need to buy a Max Lucado book or a Joe Olstein book or something like that from Mardell's or Lifeway. And if you do that, they'll give you a magic formula to say or fist bump or chest bump or something that'll get you there. Well, friends, we need to know and understand God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, and it doesn't come from Mardell's unless you're buying a Bible. <laughs> it better be a good one, by the way. <laughs> A good translation, and that's a whole other lesson. I'll leave that one with Scott. You see, spiritual growth is a lot like physical growth. Let's assume tomorrow is January 1st, 2023. And many of us make resolutions, do we not? And I don't know what resolution you might make, but you might decide, you know, in 2023, I want to be physically fit. I want to become fit. So let's assume you go out and you buy yourself books on how to be physically fit, right? And then you go get a gym membership. And you show up at that gym every morning for six weeks straight. You find yourself a bench. And on that bench, you just read those self-help books. <laughs> How fit are you going to be? And that's what we tend to do with worship from time to time. We buy ourselves a Max Lucado book from somewhere, show up to worship here and there, and we think that's enough spiritually. Well, friends, does it work in the gym that way? Does it work in the Lord's church that way either? The reality is, my friends, the Spirit is here to help us overcome. But we must understand that there's a, more than one piece to the puzzle. We need to have a great prayer life. We need to have a great study life where we study God's Word and meditate upon it. We need church attendance. We need fellowship with one another. We need all of these pieces that God has given us, the fruit of the Spirit, to add to our lives so that we today can overcome. Well, based off of Romans chapter 7 and verse 8, though, or chapter 7 and 8, Paul does give us a plan. He does give us what we need here to help us get rid of Satan. Notice first in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. If you want to overcome, and, and, and by the way, in reading this, the assumption is you're a Christian, right? To overcome, number one, you need to be a Christian. But in Romans 8 and verse 13, but it's through the Spirit you put to death, or the King James will say mortify, the deeds of the body, you will live. Notice what he's saying here. We take these gifts from the Spirit. We kill the deeds of the body. And we will live eternally. So what that means is, number one, each and every one of us has an individual responsibility to put to death the deeds of the body. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, Paul wrote, put to death the deeds of your nature. In the King James, it says, mortify the deeds of your members. And this is written in present tense here, meaning this is going to be a struggle that we're going to have to deal with all of our lives. Satan is constantly going to be coming at us in one way or another. But the reality is, we can overcome. God commands us to do so, meaning God then has given us the power to overcome. I like to call it this. And you might think it's funny. That's all right. Others have laughed before. I like to call it the theology of Pac-Man. You all remember Pac-Man, right? Real big in the 80s. Everybody and their dog played it. There was even this Pac-Man, right? You all know the drill. You have an overlord of evil and an overlord of good. You have Pac-Man. What's his job? To clear life, right? Get to the next level. And the overlord of evil, well, he's got these uh, ghosts. 
these demons, whatever you want to call them, temptation, sin. And he's constantly coming after us, one way or the other. But then on the other hand, you have the overlord of good. And he puts these power pellets at the four corners. And if you get to one of those power pellets, what can you do? You can gobble up the ghost. And then from time to time, he even gives you precious fruit. Right? It comes through the screen, you run up there and grab it, and something good happens. The reality is, my friends, God has given us everything that is necessary. And yes, Satan is going to chase us. That's his job. And he does it well. He's going to shoot arrows at us. But God has empowered us through the Spirit today, through the gifts of the Spirit, through prayer and through worship and through brotherly love and brotherly kindness and all these pieces. God has empowered us today to overcome. And sometimes the battle is ugly. Sometimes the battle is violent, but yet this is our responsibility in salvation, and that is to kill it, to kill the temptations, to kill the lust of the flesh, to kill it through the Spirit, to kill it for the Spirit, and to kill it hard. It's a beautiful day today, isn't it? Man, yesterday morning was a little rough, but that's all right. This is Texas. We always bounce back, right? <laughs> beautiful day. It's church eat church. Hope you plan to stay for the fellowship meal and then uh, what's going to follow after? I am. There's going to be food. Who passes up free food? <laughs> so let's put that aside. So you go home this afternoon and you have the kids or the grandkids and you decide you're going to put the grandkids out in a little kiddie pool in the backyard. Let them splash around in a couple inches of water. You go inside to get yourself a big old glass of Texas iced tea, right? Because that's what we do in Texas. A bunch of ice and a little bit of tea. <laughs> and then you go back, about, you go back outside, and in between you and that kiddie pool is a rattlesnake. Only four or five foot long. <laughs> what are you going to do with that thing? The snake is there to cause harm. Satan is in our lives to cause harm. What are you going to do with that thing? You going to call it? Give it a name? Hey, Tim. Let's call it Tim. Hey, Tim. Come, Tim. No. You're going to kill it. And how are you going to kill it? You're going to kill it hard. And you're going to kill it dead over and over again because it represents danger. And my friends, when it comes to this ignorant thing, <laughs> when it comes to Satan, we know he's attacking us. And when we see the attack, it is our job to kill it, to murder the uninvited guest so that we don't have to do it again. And why should we want to murder him? Well, this is why. Because in chapter 8 and verse 9, the Spirit of God dwells in you. What does that mean? Well, we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, where he's talking about us individually here. And he says, know you not that your body is the temple of God or the temple of the Holy Ghost? What does that mean? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he's dealing with sexual immorality. He's dealing with sexual sins. And Paul's point is this. If the Spirit of God indwells in us, and it does as Christians, if the Spirit indwells in us, then we should desire to get rid of all of the evil, all of the ugly, because we don't want to share the ugly with him. You remember the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the temple? When they built both, the glory of God came down upon both of them. And as long as they walked in line with God, the glory of God remained with them. But as soon as they strayed, what happened to the glory of God? And now today, we in Christ are the temple of God. Why would we want to share it with cussing? Why would we want to share it with drinking? Why would we want to share it with fornication or adultery? Why would we want to share him with that? You think he's going to remain? So these are reasons as to why we should want to mortify, put to death, kill all of the evil arrows of Satan. But also, let us know we're not going to do it all by ourselves. The reality is victory is possible today because of another. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, the Bible says that the spirit of him raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. 
The reality is we can't rid him from the flesh all by ourselves. But there is one who has paved the way for us. And through the spirit of Christ, my friends, the one that now holds the keys to sin and death, the one that was put in the grave and up from the grave he arose, we today now can overcome through him. You see, Jesus took the war to Satan. And I know Satan bruised his heel, but then Jesus squashed him like the dirty little bug that he is. And through that squashing, we today have every opportunity to be delivered. Paul asked in chapter 7 and in verse 24, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And the answer is who? Christ. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul then reminds us there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, the battle is ugly. And you remember, we started the battle with sin, right? We started the battle with someone taking advantage of us and deceiving us. But we know through the power of his blood and the power of his word and prayer and Bible study, confession and repentance and so many other pieces, we can overcome today while we work out our salvation with fear and with trembling, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. And by this, each and every day, we can obtain itty-bitty victories over Satan. But those itty-bitty victories just represent the one that is coming one day for all of us who continue to fight that fight. And if we fight that fight with Jesus, with the gifts of the Spirit, notice the blessings that come from it. In chapter 8 and verse 2, you will have the Spirit of life. Notice in chapter 8 and verse 6, you will be spiritually minded, which is life and peace. In chapter 8 and verse 10, the Spirit will be alive in you because of righteousness. In chapter 8 and verse 11, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. In 8 and verse 13, if you put to death the deeds of our mortal bodies, you shall live. 8 and 15, you'll receive the spirit of adoption. 8 and 16 and 17, you'll be heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and you will be glorified. Well, friends, I know this walk can be discouraging. I know it can be trying. And I know from time to time that the flesh and the battle of it, sometimes it may overcome the spirit. But the reality is, my friends, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So let's live by the Spirit. Let's walk by the Spirit. Let's behave as the Spirit will. And then here's the glorious gift of them all. We started the lesson with this. We're going to end it with a new body. Because if we're in Christ and we obtain victory through him, where there is no condemnation because of him. One day up from the grave, we will arise. We'll have a new body. We don't know what it's going to look like or be like, but it's going to be like his. And what that means is a body that knows no sin. Don't you want it? A body that knows no sin, knows no pain, knows no hair loss, <laughs> knows no joint aching. You got a beautiful set of hair. What are you laughing about? <laughs> <laughs> you want to trade after? <laughs> <laughs> Friends, why would we not want that? And if you are not in Christ Jesus this morning, this gift is yours. All you got to do is, is obey His commandments. And that starts with being born again. And if you believe that he is the Son of God, risen from the grave, well, why not? Why not allow your faith to work and confess the name of Jesus before men? Repent, be baptized for remission of your sins. But you can receive the gift of the Spirit. And perhaps you did that. But you know, the mud and the muck are causing ruts. And you need the prayers of the church. Well, I know I've said this here before. These are not aisles of shame. But I've added to that. What they are, they are aisles of the walk of fame. Because you look at those in Hebrews chapter 11. When they messed up, what would they do? And because of that, they're famous. And if you want to be famous in the eyes of God, well, you know what you need to do. Come now, Jesus.